So where we left the, the lecture last week is talking about uh, memory on the frontal lobes, where damage to the frontal lobes doesn't cause uh, symptoms of amnesia, but nevertheless brain imaging shows that it's important for certain aspects of memory retrieval and uh, encoding, and we can think of it as working with memory uh, there. But actually, the, the frontal lobes aren't just involved in memory, they're involved in all aspects of cognition, um, uh, including, uh, for that matter, uh, things that are seen as low level, like perception. So certainly our kind of awareness of this, our interpretation of images and, and, and so on, would, uh, would also be involved here. So the image here is uh, the idea of a metaphor uh, of the frontal lobes as kind of being the conductor of cognition. Uh, where the rest of the brain, so your posterior cortex, your limbic system and so on, are all doing their more specialised tasks, whether it's, you know, kind of playing the violin or the, the trumpet or whatever, that they have some degree of specialisation. And the frontal lobes is effectively coordinating that. And here we could think about it in terms of silencing or amplifying, making things louder, coordinating when two things happen at once or multiple things happen at the same time. And I think that this analogy is good up to a point, but of course the, the point at which it ceases to be good is, well, how does that conductor work? What's happening in the conductor's brain? Who's conducting the conductor? And of course, at that point, that analogy breaks down. There can't be uh, somebody in the frontal lobes who's coordinating them, uh, or then the question is, who coordinates the frontal lobes? And there can be no other kind of system beyond them. So, of course, we, um, the, the analogy breaks down in the sense that this cannot be a strict controller. It must be kind of a guide uh, of the other things, but the whole system itself is a controlled system that operates uh, as a kind of a coordinated network, with obviously some regions exerting more influence uh, than others. And that's uh, the, one of the things that, that I will talk about here. But the, the basic idea is, has been called a homunculus problem. The idea is that in that person's head, there is somebody that controls him, and he, in the, his controller's head, there's somebody that controls that, and you just carry on and on. Uh, and that's the, the kind of philosophical problem called the homunculus problem. Here we can, um, the, cognitively, we, we refer to this as executive functions, or it's also called kind of cognitive control. And the idea behind this is that there are some things that cannot occur automatically in cognition where you need some other system. And basically, those kinds of situations are where you need to coordinate multiple processes, where each process might have their automatic mode of functioning, but in order to make them all work together, you need something that, that coordinates amongst them. So we can think of it as supervisory or controlling rather than being specific to one domain. So it is involved in memory, it is involved in perception, it is involved in language, but it is not specific to those things. It is involved in uh, And really the other um, key thing uh, here where people talk about the role of executive functions uh, is the distinction between automatic and controlled behavior. Uh, and the idea is that controlled behavior requires executive functions, whereas automatic behavior uh, does not. So in a way, um, you could also think of this as switching off automatic behaviour and engaging in other modes of uh, activity. Historically, it's been linked um, to the prefrontal cortex, and I would say that that is still true. Uh, but what has changed is that people understand that the frontal cortex does its job by interacting with other regions. And in particular, people are very interested in the idea of uh, this frontoparietal network which is involved in kind of selecting and maintaining uh, what it is that you're trying to do, your goals, your kind of top-down task set. <clears throat> and unsurprisingly, this uh, notion of kind of cognitive control and flexibility and so on has been linked to intelligence, uh, both within humans and across animal species. Uh, and again, people have been interested in the fact that uh, uh, so, so here, the primate line, that there's been this kind of expansion of uh, the prefrontal cortex uh, relative to other regions. Uh, so these are all primates there. Given that the prefrontal cortex is so big, it's a little bit naive to assume that it does just one thing. And in fact, really the transition over the last 20, 30 years has been to understand that different parts of the prefrontal cortex are involved in somewhat different things, and we'll pick up on that thread uh, 
particularly in the second half of the lecture. But basically, in terms of growth structures, we can think of it as having three surfaces. It's, uh, if it's occupied the front of your head, you've got a surface that's above your eyes, which is your orbital surface, or uh, the orbits are the, the kind of the eye sockets. So that's your orbital frontal cortex. You've then got the outer part um, of the frontal lobes, and that's your lateral prefrontal cortex. And then you've got the inner part, so where you have to prise apart the two uh, hemispheres, and that's your medial surface here. And again, within these, there are different subregions, but this is quite a helpful division that basically the orbital surface seems to do somewhat different things from the lateral, and the medial also has other functions. Uh, and in particular, they might differ with the kinds of information they process. So the orbital surface seems to be particularly important for processing emotional uh, and social information, and the, uh, the lateral, more kind of cognitive information, so uh, attending to kind of things in the environment, to, to uh, perceptual objects and things like that. Um, and the classic example of uh, what, what's on, something to be called disexecutive syndrome or damage to the frontal lobes is uh, the case of Phineas Gage. So this dates back to the 1840s, where basically he was working on uh, an American railroad. In order to do that, they would lay dynamite, dynamite under the ground to, uh, to clear rocks and so on. And you put the dynamite in the ground and then you put rocks on top of it and you tamp it down with... Uh, an iron, which is a long stick, and this is actually Phineas Gage holding his tamping iron here. What happened is that the dynamite kind of exploded as he kind of pushed down, and the rod kind of went under his eye and flew out of the top of his head and landed several metres uh, behind him. Uh, so obviously it damaged his eye, you can see that also uh, in the, the, the photograph here. But after this, what he did is that he actually uh, walked back to his... Uh, um, his centre. They had telegrams in the 1840, and he telegrammed for a doctor. So he was walking and talking and said, a very strange thing has happened to me, uh, in, in effect. And literally, he would have a physical hole through his head because it was hot. It would kind of burn a kind of hole in it, which actually helps to seal it. Otherwise, uh, you would have a lot of problems. He carried on uh, living afterwards. Um, he uh, did a stint in Barnum Circus and, and things like this, uh, kind of showing people his, uh, his injury and his stick. But basically, his personality was fundamentally changed. He would tell inappropriate jokes. Uh, he was impatient and obstinate. He couldn't coordinate his uh, finances, or he would make plans and then quickly give them up and, uh, and change them. Uh, no longer employable. Uh, he does not estimate size or money accurately. He would not take £1,000 for a few pebbles he had collected. I'm sure he probably did understand uh, money and numbers. It's just that everything loses its kind of subjective value um, with this because all of your goals become uh, altered uh, as a result of this. And it's subsequently been shown that actually, although it damaged the frontal lobes, it's damaged one particular part of it, and we'll come back to that. So what I'd like to do is just show you empirical evidence of the kinds of tasks where executive functions uh, are needed. <coughs> and, um, and talk about them in terms of evidence, particularly for brain imaging and patients with this. And then we'll talk about whether this proves that there's some kind of unitary uh, system here or whether there are further fractionations. And these are the four domains that I'll go through. So task setting and problem solving is related strongly to the idea of fluid intelligence. So fluid intelligence is kind of thinking on your feet, so being able to find novel solutions for, for problems you've never encountered. Crystallised intelligence is things like uh, factual knowledge, so uh, quiz shows such as The Chase, and so this is your uh, crystallised intelligence. And these are the kinds of tests that, that people have done. So they're where you've got, a, um, say, a set of beads here, and what you have to do is that you have to move these sets of beads, say, to there, one at a time. So here you have to plan ahead to get to this one. You would put the red here first, and then move the green out of the way, and then put the red back. And here the optimal solution is five moves. What you would have is that patients who have damaged their frontal cortex would take more than five moves uh, to do that. They do it more with trial and error rather than planning in their head. So again, this is also related to the notion of working memory, is that you can actually 
perform the task without moving the beads, and then you, you kind of uh, do it afterwards. <coughs> and this is particularly true of patients who damage their, their left prefrontal cortex. Here that they, uh, do that. And similarly, you can do this in healthy participants and, for instance, compare more and more difficult ones and show that the level of difficulty will track acti activity in the frontal lobes with fMRI. So that's a, uh, a spatial, a visuospatial task. In the verbal domain, uh, there's something called cognitive estimates, which look like they're kind of factual knowledge, but in fact nobody knows the answer. So how many camels are in Holland? Uh, basically, the idea behind that is that you don't know the answer, so you have to come up with a strategy, which is that camels are not native in Holland, that there are perhaps three or four zoos in Holland, and a zoo typically has... Uh, a handful of camels at most. So you can generate plausible answers through going through that. Whereas patients with frontal lobe damage would kind of go with their intuition. They would not find a kind of a path through the, the problem set, if you will. So they may give kind of very outland chances. Another test of flexibility is to generate as many words beginning with a letter as possible. Now, you kind of imagine that if I say the letter F, that you, you would open up your mental lexicon and they would all kind of come flooding out. But if you try doing this for, for just 10, 15 seconds, you will realise that, um, that actually you, you reach a, a stop. So you might go through all the animals and then you have to shift category and think of uh, objects in your house beginning with an F. So you're having to generate strategies in order to search your lexicon. They don't just all fall out uh, at will. Uh, and again, uh, they would typically have low scores on this because they can't generate the, I suppose, the problem space for even searching uh, your, your kind of memory store for that sort of thing. Can I ask it's, a question? Yeah. Do you know with the cognitive estimates, <coughs> um, so surely that would sort of work with the level of difficulty and everything else? You would, actually, yes, you're right. So yes, I think the eye, yes, that's entirely right. So knowing, for instance, whether or not a camel is native to that country, and so on, you're, you're right. Um, so, so this becomes one of the problems with these tests is that none of them are kind of what you would call process pure. They all involve other skills as well. Um, yeah, so the, here typically you would give the patients, or for instance, other assessments of semantic knowledge just to check that they can do those right. So you would be looking at a relative difficulty in this kind of thing that goes beyond what they would know. So you might, for instance, I've not actually seen it done as a control test, but you could ask, for instance, um, their knowledge of animals and where, which countries they live in and things like that so to, to, to show that. But you're right. And th this is a general problem of, of this, is that pretty much any task that you would have would have some prior expertise or knowledge that, that it's been tapped. In terms of links to fluid intelligence, um, John Duncan's proposed that actually the, uh, the lateral frontal lobes here, maybe regions of the medial, together with the uh, parietal lobes, are kind of involved in this. And basically, they've done various uh, things with this. What they've done is kind of what are called meta-analyses, where basically you take all the different tests that are looking at um, problem solving or, or the test that we've looked at say in fMRI and you effectively just overlay the patterns of activity and see whether the test kind of segregate or aggregate and basically what he says is that all the tests effectively aggregate around this region here which he calls the multiple demand network multiple demands meaning that they they are just broadly there uh, for any of these kinds of problem solving things uh, but he also argues that this is involved in intelligence and classic kind of fluid intelligence measures like what's called Raven's matrices. So here you have to decide what goes there. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be a square. And, it's probably, and I think it's going to have a line through it. So it's going to be a big square. It's going to be number four here. Um, so patients who have damaged the frontal lobes also have problems on these kind of measures of intelligence, but not measures of crystallized intelligence. So crystallized intelligence is what you were asking about, your kind of semantic knowledge, your knowledge of who wrote what, which countries camels live in, that sort of thing. The other kind of domain which is important is overcoming potent or habitual responses. So here, this is the idea that the frontal lobes are involved in overcoming automatic uh, 
uh, kind of answers. In these tests here, remember that there are no automatic answers really to how many cabins there are in Hong. So it's a different kind of set of problems that are being asked. But you can give problems where there are automatic answers and then see um, how they do. So the classic example of this is, of course, the, the Stroop test where you have to um, name the colour and ignore the, uh, the written word. So here the answers are red, green, yellow, blue, yellow, and white. And you can show that people are slow uh, at doing that relative to the other one. Uh, but the patients with frontal lobe lesions, particularly in a region called the anterior cingulate, which I'll, I'll come back to later, uh, are bad at this. And this is linked to the notion of inhibition. And here the idea is that what you're having to inhibit is a kind of a more automatic tendency to read words. So normally whenever you see a word, you can't help but read it. Uh, and, and not by read it, I mean not necessarily saying it's allowed, uh, but you can't just see it as a pattern of lines or you know squiggles that they have meaning uh, to you. So to, in order to do this, you're having to inhibit your automatic response, which is to read, and set up a new response, which is to name the colours, which is less habitual. Um, that. So patients with frontal lobe damage would take longer and be more error-prone in this particular task. What they can also do is that they can show... Um, <coughs> Uh, behaviour in terms of their everyday uh, life, that they, going around the house, for instance, that they would tend to repeat actions that they've already done. This is called perseveration, and I'll give you a kind of a test example of that. Uh, but also they could do what's called utilisation behaviour, and that's basically fiddling with any objects that are laid in front of them. So, for instance, if there's a pen in front of them, they'll pick it up and start writing. There's a mug there, they'll pick it up and start handling it or seeing what's in it. And the idea here is that you've effectively got um, your vision and objects kind of a triggering certain action schemas. And the action schemas are being triggered irrespective of any goals that they have. So they have no real intentions of writing or, or needing to drink or whatever. But if something's in front of them, it's kind of... Uh, going into uh, like a stimulus response uh, mode. This is also related to notions of impulsivity. So go, no go, uh, it's a specific example of this, where you're told to, to carry on pressing a button and then maybe w one on every 10 trials it changes colour and you have to withhold it. Uh, and again, what happens is that people get so into pressing the button the whole, the whole time that they then don't withhold it on the no go. So, uh, again, this is clinically relevant, and a lot of um, neurodevelopmental disorders and so on are kind of explained in terms of impulsivity or kind of uh, frontal regulation of behaviour and emotions. Uh, and so. so, task switching is basically, uh, again, we could think of it in terms of cognitive flexibility that all of a sudden the rules of the game change and you have to uh, adjust and adapt. Or that the rules of the game are not obvious, that, that you have to kind of infer and figure out what's going on. So this is one of the classic examples where you're having to do this, where you're given a, a pack of cards here. And what you have to do is that you have to sort them into these different paths here. But there are multiple rules that you could do. So if we look at these two blue crosses here, you could either sort them according to number, so two goes with two, or you could sort them to colour, so blue goes with blue, or you could sort them with shape, so cross goes with cross. And there are three rules of four sets, so there's always uh, one set which is like, uh, I guess, a control that is, doesn't follow any uh, obvious rule. There would be no logical reasons for putting it there. And what you have is that you might, for instance, here sort according to number, and then the patient is, or the participant is given feedback. So they're told that's correct. Here you've got three objects, so you put it there, and you're told that's correct. Here you've got four objects, you put it here, you're told that's correct. Here you've got two objects, so you put it there, but you're told, no, that is incorrect. So what happens is that the rule will change unpredictably. So at this point, you have to then change your strategy. You're having to switch which rule is active. And of course, you don't know what it is. So at that point, you've got a trial and error decision between either going to shape, 
or going to colour. And eventually you will then settle on the new rule. What you find is that patients with damage to the frontal lobes have problems in, in kind of switching to new rules. And again, they do something which is called perseveration. And that means they keep going back to previously successful rules that are no longer successful. So given an incorrect answer with that, they would then habitually carry on uh, giving that, that particular incorrect answer, even though to begin with they were doing fine. So it's almost as if they could do a task, but they lose the flexibility to adapt when uh, uh, situations change, when environment changes. So here we're changing rule to sort by uh, colour. This... This test was um, developed to, to, to the Wisconsin Cardsort to do with patients, but basically since the 1990s there have been a whole set of paradigms that have been involved that you can effectively use in health participants to look at the neural substrates of this in, uh, in fMRI. And these are often more simpler because this particular clinical test involves lots of things. It involves inferring a rule, it involves unpredictable switches, not quite knowing which new rule to go for and so on. These are the kinds of experimental situations that you would have, uh, for instance, if you're doing an fMRI scan with people, in which, for instance, you've got um, letters and numbers appearing in four different positions. And basically what you have is that, in this case, when the letter is in the top here, you just say uh, whether it's a consonant or a vowel, for instance. <coughs> and when, the, when it's in the bottom, you say whether the digit is a uh, odd or even. I think that that's what you would do here. So here you do a letter task, and then here you do a letter task, here you change the digit task, here you change the digit task. So you kind of go round and round in this predictable way. The interesting thing about this is that you've got two kinds of trials. You've got what are called non-switch trials. So going from this one to this one is a non-switch. You're still dealing with letters and deciding your whether, uh, whether it's a consonant or a vowel. But then as you go from here to here, you're then switching your task. What you can do is that you can look at the reaction times here and show that basically that these switch trials um, involve a slowing uh, of cognition. So going from here to here, for instance, where you're changing from letters to digits involves a long reaction time. Uh, and here it's uh, a few hundred milliseconds. What's interesting is that basically that that remains even if you're given a long time to kind of prepare in your head. So if basically, so if you're waiting a second here, so you know that you're changing tasks, you still have a switch cost. So there's still something about when the new stimulus appears, having to change the, the, the test, even though you know the change is coming. And the question is, why is that? Are you slow because you're having to get rid of your old task, or are you slow because you're having to set up your new task? The way you can test that is you can have tests that differ in terms of whether or not they're easy or difficult. So basically, if, you're, if the cost comes because you're having to switch off a task, then switching off a, ver a very difficult task should require a lot more uh, cognitive effort, in effect. <clears throat> and what you find is that basically that most of the switch cost is involved in inhibiting the old task. <clears throat> what this means is that it's easier, um, there's a great switch cost when you're switching from something that's hard to switching to, from, to something that's easy. Because when you've got something hard, it's more effortful to kind of, uh, to suppress it. And in everyday life, what this means is that it's, um, it's that there's more switch costs in switching from your second language to your first language than the other way around, because your second language is harder. It's harder to, to switch off, basically. I don't know whether that, I'm not a second language speaker, but, but that's about people's intuition. Have you tested that uh, with the strict test? Um, yes, they have. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, in what way with this? Uh, like looking at the reaction time when you go from reading the words to reading the text. Yes, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so that's the second point here. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah that's a very clever. But uh, maybe you were primed. 
But yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, so here that you've got the, an asymmetry there is that when you go from um, uh, from the hard from, second language. Yes, that's right. So color naming is the harder task than than word naming. So uh, so when you switch there, you, it's, you find it easier to, to go in that direction than the opposite direction here. So again, it suggests that, uh, that here the frontal lobes are uh, primarily involved in, in doing that. And what you can do here is that you can then use this paradigm in fMRI to compare switch trials against non-switch trials and see which brain regions uh, are important. And here you get a wide um, set of brain regions that are active on the switch trials relative to non-switch trials. And of course, you could look at easy switch and hard switch. Uh, trials as well, and you would get the same pattern. What's also interesting is that it looks as if the, the whole kind of frontal lobes are involved in this switching thing. But actually what you can do is that you can look at what it is that's switching. So for instance, in this particular thing, um, two things are, there are multiple things that are switching. So whether or not you are attending to the letters or the numbers, and, and, and so on. But sometimes what you can do is that you just simply switch which uh, buttons you press. So it's exactly the same task, you're just switching the buttons. In other ones, you're actually switching the task and keeping the same buttons, for instance, uh, and so on. And what you find is that depending on which thing you're switching from, you will get differences in what is um, active within your frontal lobes, whether or not uh, it is the response or the stimulus that, that is changing or both. Um, so, so again, there, are, there is this kind of hint of different specialisations where the medial frontal lobes are more involved in uh, inhibiting um, an old response and the lateral frontal lobes are involved in inhibiting an old stimulus in effect. So multitasking is basically doing or attempting to do multiple things at once. Here, obviously, physically, it can be impossible to do multiple things at once, but the idea is that you're holding in mind multiple competing goals, and at an, any given point in time, you might just be doing one thing. Here, this was a test that was involved, uh, again, or developed for, for patients to, uh, to test with frontal lobe damage, where basically they are given six different tasks to do. So in one case, they have to do sets of maths, in another, I think they've got to sort pictures into different ones. In another, they have to write them down. So they've kind of set it up that there are six different things to do, but basically the instructions are you need to do a bit of each task uh, and you will not have time to do them all. Because, uh, and the idea here is that the, the patient, in effect, has to stop one task and start another. And what you would find here is that um, the patient's uh, here would, would clearly or seem to understand the instructions but, but then get lost in a task and then come to the end of the time and say, oh yes, I forgot to switch uh, with this. So here this is a little bit like uh, the task switching but here they're having to generate uh, all the kind of the, the switches themselves. A model that, that kind of attempted to account for all these phenomena was developed um, that was called the uh, Supervisory Attentional System that basically argues that the frontal lobes are, are kind of like a bias uh, of ongoing cognition. Um, and this, this was very influential, partly because it, it aimed to kind of solve the, um, the, uh, the, kind of the, the more homunculus problem in the sense that the frontal lobes aren't necessarily n making the, the decisions. What they're doing is that they are biasing uh, activity amongst a wide set of systems. What does that, that exactly mean? Well, what that means is that when you're doing a set of tasks or in everyday life, there's a whole set of things that are being triggered. Um, so here, when you're looking at objects, they will trigger certain actions and so on and trigger certain responses. And the idea here is that what you're doing in the top down is that you are just biasing towards certain things, which is why it's seen as being like attention, but here's attention onto a task. Uh, 
So here it might be, for instance, focusing on the, the colour of a word rather than what the word means in the Stroop test. It might be, for instance, focusing on the, uh, the shapes rather than the, uh, uh, the colour in the Wisconsin card sorting and so on. And the idea is that what happens is that after frontal lobe damage, this system here becomes weaker. And what you've got is, in effect, just a bottom-up kind of act, habitual kind of activation of all these things. Or, or you start to follow one rule, but then you lose the inability to change it. So in effect, you're kind of going through this kind of automatic autopilot uh, system here without any of this kind of top-down regulation. So the idea, but the key thing there is that the top-down system is not making the decision, it's biasing the decision. The whole decision comes from a mixture of these kind of bottom-up influences and the top-down, and the decision here is like what button you choose, what colour you choose, or whatever is there. What you would also have is a system that's involved in kind of selecting uh, from them as well. So you've got biases from the bottom up, biases from the top down, and then in effect you've got an element of competition, which itself might be a perceptually based attention or this task based attention that is just selecting one thing that is driving the action. And this would kind of explain uh, performance on these kinds of tests. Uh, but also kind of everyday uh, behaviour that you, you're kind of very impulsive, that you kind of can gamble because you're, you're not got the biasing influence of your uh, top-down system. And basically this general way of thinking about the prefrontal cortex is contemporary now, the idea that it's a biasing influence rather than something that is uh, necessarily the ultimate kind of arbiter of a, a decision. But there have been several problems with a, a simple model that attains, claims to account for everything in this way. And basically this was kind of known um, for quite a while uh, at, at the time, is that you would find some patients who, according to CT or MRI scans, clearly have damage uh, to the, the, the prefrontal cortex. Um, but they pass, for instance, the Stroop test, they pass the Wisconsin card sorting test, they pass pretty much all the tests that you have, but they have no frontal lobe damage, and in everyday life they're behaving like Phineas Gage. That they, um, for instance, have problems organising their, uh, their money, they tell inappropriate jokes, they've got this kind of thing. So the question is, what do we make of that? Now, one solution of, for this is that, well, actually, it's a bit unfair for these tests to be perfect because they're, you know, they're lab-based tests. No, they might be good, but nobody says that they're going to be perfect. That's one solution. The other solution is actually these tasks are only good for certain kinds of things, and the, the frontal lobes might uh, be fractionated into different ways. Something that's, for instance, controlling the social world and these kind of more... Uh, joke telling, finance behaviours and so on and others that are involved in passing these more lab based tests and how can we tease these apart well they have been teased apart and that does seem to be the answer that there are multiple uh, kind of control systems and the control systems that are being tapped in all of these tests are somewhat different from uh, the ones that give rise to this kind of Phineas Gage type behaviour <coughs> And also it was pointed out that, um, that, that when you look at these tests, that what you might expect is that if they're all tapping roughly the same construct, that you would have patients who uh, fail the ball, uh, for instance, or the more difficult ones they would fail and the more easy ones they wouldn't, but you shouldn't have double dissociations where one patient can't do the Stroop test but can do the Wisconsin card sorting and stuff. But it became clear that actually you would find those kinds of cases fairly reliably and it suggests that within those tests that there are some kind of differences. So what do we make of these differences and how can we characterise them in terms of different elements of uh, cognitive control? So these are various divisions in terms of uh, different operations of the, the, the front lobes and where they might lie. So you can look at differences between the different surfaces of the brain, so the lateral versus the orbitofrontal, the left and the right, the front and the back, 
uh, and then this, this is the kind of, again, the middle and the outside here. So you can kind of dissect it anatomically and figure out what exactly uh, is going on here and how is it parcelated into different things. So the, the example which is most commonly agreed on is the division between what's called the orbitofrontal surface, which is the one above your eyes, and the lateral surface. <coughs> And basically, the, um, this is one study that was uh, a lesion study in Marmosets, who are kind of uh, a, a, new, uh, a new world primate, um, where basically it was shown that damaging different parts of the frontal lobe altered task switching in completely different ways, depending on what the actual task was. And basically what they did is that they taught the animals to, um, to kind of associate these particular compound stimuli. And the compound stimuli, because they have two elements, they have shapes and lines. <clears throat> so basically what you would um, have here is that in one case, for instance, you would learn that this shape was rewarded here, okay? And in another case, you would learn that this shape was not rewarded. So if you're presented with the two of them, you go for that and you will get your banana juice or whatever they give these marmosets. Okay. What you have in reversal learning is that you just simply swap what is rewarded uh, and what isn't rewarded. So now the thing that was rewarded is now the thing you ignore and the thing that was previously ignored now becomes the thing that's rewarded. What you find with reversal learning is that if you damage your orbitofrontal cortex, which is involved in rewards, emotional behaviour, social behaviour, and so on, the, the, the monkeys are impaired at this particular task. But if you damage your lateral frontal lobes, they're not impaired at reversal learning. So as soon as the rewards are swapped between stimulus A and B, um, your orbitofrontal cortex is involved in computing and updating that particular switch but the lateral frontal lobes are not. Whereas what's found is that the lateral frontal lobes are involved in um, switching the entire kind of task. So not just switching um, between stimulus and responses, but actually changing the, the whole focus. So in the initial um, learning, what you have is that the shapes are rewarded, but instead of the shapes being rewarded, now it's the lines that are rewarded. So here, instead of switching the rewards around, you're switching... Um, between shapes and lines. Okay? Uh, so it's, people talk about this as kind of more of a perceptual or kind of a cognitive shift rather than a reward shift. Okay? And what you find here is the opposite dissociation, that the lateral frontal lobes are important for uh, what's called set shifting, but not uh, important for reversal learning and, and vice versa. So as a result of this, Diaz et al. argued that basically the, the frontal lobes have at least two systems for uh, cognitive control or for what they called inhibition. One that's for inhibiting uh, rewards and choosing to enable you to flexibly choose new rewards and one that's involved in inhibiting, uh, in effect, what's called attentional sets where they're currently focusing on shapes or lines, for instance, rather than which is... Uh, and this is broadly a stud the test of time. And the idea here is that the, this kind of reversal learning, knowing what is currently rewarded or not, is very much the kind of more Phineas Gage characteristic of uh, linked to kind of poor social behaviour, poor emotional regulation. Whereas this kind of switching between lines and shapes and so on is much more kind of, well, intelligence, so what is social intelligence, and what is intelligence as we would generally kind of understand it, I suppose, and these are mediated by different uh, frontal systems. Let me show you a video that, that looks at this kind of thing. In 1861, one of the most celebrated patients in medical history died in San Francisco. His name was Phineas Gage, and 13 years earlier, he'd been the victim of a freak accident. He was buried without autopsy. But in 1994, using computerized brain imaging techniques, the husband and wife team of Hannah and Antonio Damasio performed a virtual autopsy using an electronic scalpel. 
Working with his railroad gang in Vermont, Gage was dynamiting large rocks when a tamping rod, more than a yard long and an inch and a quarter in diameter, blasted up through his cheek, behind his eye, and out of the top of his skull. Astonishingly, he survived. He was still intelligent. His language and memory were intact. But he was a radically different person. As his colleagues put it, Gage was no longer Gage. The likable, hard-working, socially responsible character became untrustworthy, used profane language, and lied to his friends. It was as if the rod had destroyed the moral compass in his brain. The Damasio's detective work struck an immediate chord because several of their patients at the University of Iowa were, in a sense, modern Phineas Gages. We have a large number of patients, neurological patients, who as a result of diseases have damage in certain sectors of the brain. It's a little hard to picture it, but you can think of them especially in the front part of the brain. And when there is damage in those areas, what happens is that patients become unable to read certain social clues out in society. So they will be, they will have difficulty picking up uh, the significance of a facial expression or the significance of, for instance, a shrugging of the shoulders. Uh, and likewise, those patients will also not be able to perform uh, in relation to what is expected uh, in terms of the social contract. You see those okay, Joe? Meet yeah. Joe. Until a stroke in 1989, he was a high-energy, creative outdoorsman with a cheerful, fun-loving personality. Now, according to his wife, Dee, he's always in neutral. A windmill. This experiment gets to the heart of Joe's problem. A woman and a little boy. The electrodes are recording his skin conductance response, a measure of his emotional state. Picture of a skinny man. How skin? Awful skinny. Somebody ice feeding. There's a man burning himself. Typically, People generate a strong skin conductance response to the disturbing pictures, but not to the routine bland ones. And yet, no matter what the picture, Holocaust victim or smiling child, Joe's response is flat, outside and in. Intellectually, he understands what he's seeing, but emotionally, he doesn't connect. Like Phineas Gage, Joe has lost key components of his social brain the evolved mechanisms that, behind the scenes, smoothly process and integrate reason and emotion have been damaged. The goal of the game is to guess at which decks you can make the most money off of. To test his ideas about the social brain, Damasio uses experiments designed with his colleague Antoine Bashara. They're called the gambling experiments. In front of you, there are four decks of cards. You're hooked up to a polygraph machine and told to keep turning over cards from any of the four decks. I'll give you some money each time you select a card. With every card, you win play money. Two of the decks pay $100, but they have an unexpected sting in the tail. You might have to pay the experimenter, sometimes as much as $1,250. So you owe me $200. With the other two decks, you win only $50, but the possible penalty is much smaller less than a hundred dollars on average. The goal of the game is to make as much money as you can. So it has some of the same elements as the game of life. Uncertainty, some risk, punishment and reward, and a blend of reasoning and intuitions. You win fifty dollars, but you lose fifty, so it's easy. Initially, I did what most people do, favor the two high-paying decks. That is, until the experimenters started demanding big penalties. So you owe me fifty dollars. Having learned my lesson, I eventually curbed my gambling impulses and shuffled over to the safety of the other two low-payment, low-punishment decks. You win $100. Typically, over 100 plays, a normal subject will retreat to the safer decks about 70% of the time. 
Damasio's frontal lobe patients do the exact opposite. By halfway through the game, they're often bankrupt, which has happened to some of them in real life following their brain damage. Now, how can their judgment, their prediction of future consequences, be so disastrous? Damasio believes there may be a tantalizing clue in the polygraph responses. As the game went on, my graph showed a new trace that wasn't there at the beginning. I had the usual response after each penalty or reward, but I also began to develop a response just before picking a card from the risky decks. And that response increased as the game continued. You win $50, but you lose 20 In other words, according to Damasio, my brain was gradually learning to anticipate the penalty and sending an alarm signal, a gut feeling, if you like, that could be picked up by the polygraph. The first gut feeling is actually a very good one. It just shows that people have been very wise for millennia in spotting the fact that some of their choices are very closely connected to emotions and they're very closely following on emotions. In other words, the gut feeling is a marker for something that ultimately may be good or bad. Now here's the key finding. None of Damasio's patients showed this anticipatory response. The neural networks that allow gut feelings about good or bad outcomes to guide rational decision-making are damaged. There's a break in the complex feedback loop of circuits that underpin reason and emotion. And so there's no way to make appropriate social judgments and no way for the system to be calibrated or tuned by experience. So, yeah, that was. Um, basically, what Damasio's idea behind this is, <coughs> is that he calls it the kind of the somatic uh, marker hypothesis. And he talks about this particularly in regards to the, uh, the orbital surface of what he calls the ventromedial. So basically, your orbital surface is beneath your eyes, and then it kind of curves up, and your ventromedial is the, the curved bit here. But either way, this is the, uh, a separate a bit of the frontal lobes from your lateral prefrontal lobes. And it seems to be involved particularly in kind of uh, rewards and memory for rewards. And you can think of memory for rewards as like when you switch which card is going to give you the juice and so on. And all somatic markers are, are like memory tags of this is rewarding and so on, that are kind of guiding decision making is uh, how he describes it. <coughs> Um, and, and basically what's happening in his task is that you're playing this game with various cards and at some point you are learning some kind of emotional response that either you are gaining or losing money uh, from that deck. And that emotional response is partly a memory, but it's partly what he calls a somatic memory, which here is what was sort of talked about in the polygraph. It's just a skin conductance response. But his idea is that that is partly guiding your decision, that this is risky, I might not do it, and so on. The re yeah. um, do these patients have any, um, maybe sensory or psychopathy? Yep, that's yep, that's exactly right, yeah. So, um, so basically, when Damasio published this, he described them as having what he called acquired sociopathy. So sociopathy used to be the, the, the psychiatric a term that would replace psychopathy. The idea is that sociopathy was seen as being a nicer term than psychopathy, but basically, historically, they were, they were one and the other. So that was his idea, is that basically as a result of doing that, they were like sociopaths. They couldn't keep, uh, you know, they, they would fall out with their family the whole time. They would argue, this sort of thing. They weren't necessarily cruel. So people imagine psychopaths as going out there and deliberately being cruel. Uh, and that's actually not necessarily the case, and it's not the case with these patients. So they, they would have a, a lack of kind of control over the finances. They might you know, get angry very quickly, but they're not manipulative in, in the way that the, the, the lay notion of a psychopath is. So it's not quite like that, but yeah, they, they did meet that mark. So, so that's the idea, is that they, um, that they cannot use these kind of emotional things to guide them or to update in learning and memory. Uh, is this <coughs> and this is um, this, so, so basically this is what the, the task looks like is that you have four decks 
And basically what you have to do is that you have to learn to avoid the bad decks. So the bad decks A and B are going to give you a, an overall loss, whereas the good decks are going to give you an overall profit. One of the ways that this is set up, yeah, which has also been a bit controversial about how it works, is that the bad decks initially start out as good decks. So they initially give you a very high reward of $100, and then they turn bad. And this is a little bit like the reversal learning in the Marmosets, that initially you've got something that is good, but, but then you have to learn that the good thing is no longer good. Uh, so part of this task is around reversal learning as well as learning itself, because the bad decks are not always bad, uh, and that is part of the, 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 the things that these patients are struggling to learn. This is where they, they, they're kind of usually done. But what's interesting is that patients who fail on this kind of gambling task, it does track their daily life, whether or not they you know, uh, meet this kind of sociopathy criteria, whether they fall out with their family and so on. But they can pass a lot of these, what I call cold tests. So the Wisconsin card sorting, the Stroop test, and, and so on. Uh, and then these other patients have damage there. <coughs> So again, this, the gambling test has been criticised on various grounds. One is the idea that actually it's just a measure of reversal learning. Uh, but, but again, it's been shown that reversal learning is a good predictor of uh, real life kind of impairments, at least in the social and emotional domain. Others have argued whether, uh, so Damasio's claims that skin conduct is like an unconscious gut instinct. Other people have argued actually that they, people do actually have kind of a conscious awareness of what's going on here and that that might be guiding them. To some extent these are side issues. Okay, so the take home message here in terms of this division is that this is generally um, well accepted that there is a division between what's going on in the lateral, the outside parts of the frontal lobes and this orbital going to ventromedial region in terms of uh, the control or inhibition of kind of more emotional information versus the, the control of non-emotional, what, what I kind of call more cold versus hot uh, information. Uh, the somatic marker hypothesis of Damasio is still kind of not fully accepted, but, but, but you know, uh, uh, the, the, the broad idea that the orbitofrontal cortex is involved in regulation of social and emotional behaviour needs. What about differences between the le left and the right uh, frontal lobes. Well, here this is somewhat more controversial, uh, and again, it depends what evidence you draw on. So, uh, evidence from other species tends not to show much of a difference, but this is normal for laterality anyway, is that uh, humans have far more laterality. And also because the, the differences tend to be uh, more subtle, so it's not that the left does completely different things from the right, it's rather more of a different kind of weighting of information. So these are the kinds of differences that have been reported here in terms, uh, for instance, of patients. So it's been described that the left frontal lobes are more involved in setting up tasks and the right frontal lobes are more involved in staying on a task, so maintaining, keeping with the programme, uh, th this sort of thing. So setting up a task would be planning the movements of beads, for instance, on the, uh, the Tower of London, this kind of force. For, uh, uh, forward planning. What you find is that both patients with left uh, and right frontal lesions are bad at the Wisconsin card sorting task, but often th th they're susceptible to different elements uh, of it. And basically uh, what you find is that um, the patients with the, the left frontal lobes are particularly more impaired on what's called the open-ended version. And by open-ended, this is where you're not really told the rules. You have to infer them yourselves. And basically, um, you, you don't know when the rules are going to change. So here you're having to flexibly think of the rules yourself. They're not given uh, to the uh, experiment. Whereas patients with the, the right frontal lobe lesions um, have problems in staying on track, that they have problems in kind of maintaining what the current rule is. So they can infer the current rules to begin with and, and so on, but they, uh, they kind of lose their way uh, in, in effect. So uh, they're rather different. And again, on task switching paradigms, so the right frontal lobes are kind of more perseverative in, in the sense that they're not sure, they've lost track, so they're not sure whether they're on a new rule or an old rule, uh, and they, they're, they, they're not quite sure what the current task is. <coughs> 
So in task switching, they're more likely to go back to a previous rule, whereas the patients with left frontal lesions are slower at the initial switch. So this means setting up the new task uh, or suppressing the old task. Uh, so one is uh, switching tasks and the other is keeping on task uh, in effect. So both patients and patients are impaired at task switching, but possibly for different reasons and drawing on somewhat different elements of these uh, rather complex tasks. Why that this is, is uh, isn't entirely clear. It's certainly not the case that one maps onto language and the other one not, for instance. It doesn't seem to be quite as simple as that. This is kind of more imaging, uh, evidence from uh, brain imaging that the left ones are involved, particularly in, in this study. It's kind of selecting from open-ended responses where, uh, where basically you, they're, you're not being told what to do and there isn't an obvious answer. So basically all this is, is that they had two tasks. One was a motor task and one was a verbal task. In the motor task, they simply just said, move any finger and you can decide. So here, this is just completely arbitrary. Uh, you're not following any rules. You're making up your own rules. It's kind of self-initiated what you do versus being told which finger to move. So that would be the control condition. What you find when you do that is that you get a left lateralized uh, prefrontal cortex uh, activity. So on the, the left hemisphere here, and that's specifically to choosing your own finger to move as opposed to being told that. Uh, and you get pretty much the same region if you've got words as well. So this would be say any word, which actually is quite a difficult task because it's like, yeah, it's almost too open-ended. Uh, you know, what word are you going to say? Uh, versus saying that word and you're, you're told which word uh, to say. So, so again, here you've got this particular difference. But it seems to be quite specific to the left frontal lobes. And again, you can do this by comparing, say, TMS to the left and the right uh, frontal lobes. Here, the task is something a little bit di different. It's generating random digits. So again, this is a, uh, an open-ended task where there's no right or wrong answer. So I'll literally say, think of a number between one and 10, five. Think of another number, six or whatever. And what you find basically is that, um, that the left frontal lobe, this is uh, blood flow, regional cerebral blood flow. So this is a brain imaging thing. Uh, that the left response to that, what happens is that when you're asked to produce digits very, very fast, um, what happens is that you struggle to be random and you start saying things like five, six, seven as your answer. And when that happens, your frontal lobes in effect switch off. And what you're doing is that you're then retrieving answers from memory in a non-controlled fashion. And that seems to be uh, the, the case here. So this is deviation from randomness. Uh, there is that when you're when you're asked to produce di digits uh, very quickly, uh, you stop being random, uh, but you switch from using your frontal lobes to using uh, other systems uh, in effect. But what you find in so neither sorry neither of these results are TMS, but basically TMS will result in uh, more of these kind of familiar sequences and less random behaviour, uh, where be being random is difficult. So the left frontal lobes are particularly involved in that, whereas the right frontal lobes are involved in monitoring and keeping on task, checking, uh, continuously checking, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing, for instance. <clears throat> and again, the evidence is that this is relatively uh, general insofar as it's not just there for, for words, it's there, for instance, in this study, uh, for mixture of perception tasks and memory tasks, uh, for instance, and that's just keeping monitoring whether you're whether you're right. And basically, it seems to track things such as uncertainty. So your right frontal lobes are more active uh, when you're having to uh, make judgments about things that you're less certain about. And this is consistent with the idea that you're having to monitor uh, your ongoing cognition. Whereas your left frontal lobes is setting up what it is that you're going to do. What, what's my strategy for generating digits and so on. <clears throat> what about the uh, so posterior versus the anterior is the kind of the back and the front uh, of the frontal lobes. So what's been suggested here is that you get this kind of gradient between more simple um, 
the stimulus response mapping to kind of more complex mapping here. Um, so that there is this kind of hierarchical system going from uh, back to front. So the kind of evidence for this comes from um, studies that look at uh, kind of cognitive tasks that have multiple layers to them. So the idea is that the, the, the kind of more posterior, the kind of the back of the frontal lobes here, is in, involved in very simple stimulus response mappings. So this is your standard boring cognitive uh, experiment that you see red, you press the left button, you see blue, you press the right button, for instance. So learning these kind of arbitrary mappings. But then what you have is that you can introduce um, here what's called contextual control. So the left button is red except when it's a square. The right button is blue except when it's a square and then you withhold them. So here um, it's not a sti simple stimulus response, it's stimulus and response in a context. And that involves something a little bit further forward in the frontal lobes. And then you've got um, what's called kind of uh, episodic kind of uh, branching and that means that in this particular block you do that in the next block you swap so again here you're uh, you've got another kind of level of complexity uh, uh, to that where the, the most kind of anterior portion is in effect maintaining multiple different goals so having to do five things at once which is obviously physically impossible but you are, at least in your head, trying to maintain or juggling between uh, five different, say, permutations. Nothing special about magic number five, but uh, about all you can kind of hold in mind for these things. <coughs> so again, what we find here is that these more kind of anterior regions uh, are involved, particularly when you're doing multitasking, so in which you're having to hold in mind multiple uh, different goals and you're having to then flip between one and the other versus just doing one simple task. And what we find is that again the patients with damage to these more anterior, the, the kind of what's often called the frontal pole, the most frontal part of the frontal lobes, have particular problems in multiple tasking. Uh, but they can often pass certain other tests, so things uh, for instance like Stroop tests and so on that, that are kind of classically seen as frontal lobe tests that don't really involve multiple tasking. You're just doing one thing that they can pass. But if you're, if you're alternating between the Stroop test and another test and another test, then this is where performance will start to break down when you're doing all of these things and having to manage your time uh, between them. And again, these are kind of brain regions that are particularly susceptible to certain kinds of injuries. So things like um, having car accidents and so on, the, the, the most frontal bit there will kind of ricochet in your skull, as will the, <coughs> the, the kind of orbital surface. You've got kind of a bony ridge uh, there, and the, the frontal lobes literally just kind of uh, run across it. So again, certainly you, you will perhaps meet friends or family members or whatever whose personality becomes a bit more Phineas Gage as a result of a car accident but they're still holding down jobs and so on but to their family and friends they notice actually this person's become a bit more uninhibited or that they can't cope with multiple things that they have to do one thing at a time otherwise it's very overwhelming. <coughs> So there is evidence going forward and backwards that, uh, that you've got this increase in complexity. The final one I'll talk about is a region called the anterior cingulate, which is part of the, the medial frontal lobe. So it's kind of in between uh, the, the middle here. The best I can show you is this uh, particular region there. <coughs> this region is particularly involved in detecting um, errors or also potential errors. So a kind of... It, it, it's a, a, a monitoring role that is quite similar to what was described for the, uh, the right prefrontal cortex here, but it's particularly involved in, uh, in error detection. <coughs> and what you will find is in EEG something called an error potential. And basically what this is, is that if you're doing a simple task and you, make a, you press the, the wrong button by mistake, you will have 
a bing in your brain and that bing is coming from your anterior signal that's caught it say, hang on, something's gone wrong. So this is what's called an error-related negativity. So time zero is you press the wrong button, damn it. And here, about 100 milliseconds later, you've got uh, something that's saying, hold back, you've made a mistake here. <clears throat> what you find is that when you make a mistake, when you're doing one of these kinds of experiments, is that when you've spotted you've made a mistake, what happens is that you then slow down on the next trial. So it's almost as if you've got this compensation mechanism uh, coming into place. And again, this seems to be related to this sort of system, this kind of error correction. So what you typically find is that after an error, you become more accurate and more slower. But if you've got damage to your anterior cingulate, the opposite is true. If you make an error, instead of slowing down and becoming more accurate, you go on and make other errors. It's as if you don't kind of uh, correct yourself. Yep. So there's no factor that, um, of making an error kind of damage to your frontal lobes? Um, the, the other regions of the frontal lobes. or you, you, um, The idea is that this is kind of like a detection mechanism and then the other regions would kind of co do the correction. So it's kind of like a signal that something has gone wrong, I suppose. So if you don't signal that something's gone wrong, then the other regions don't know to do that. But yeah, so they, that, that's the, uh, the, the kind of the idea that the others would still be involved. Um, but, but essentially what you, what you find is that if you compare with fMRI the error trial and then the trial after the error, that the anterior signal responds when there's an error and the, the rest of the frontal lobe responds on the trial after the error. So it's almost as if you've got these two, these regions talking to each other, that one is saying you've made an error, and then the, front, the rest of the frontal lobe say, let's do something about that. And they're either adopting a more cautious strategy, so this would be the kind of, the, the monitoring kind of role, is we need to keep on task, we need to uh, adjust these kind of parameters. So it suggests that the anterior signal is probably not correcting the error, it's kind of more detecting them and it's creating this kind of loop with the rest of the system that would say something's wrong, we need to do something uh, here in the effect. So any more questions before I kind of conclude? So to summarise, there's evidence that the prefrontal cortex isn't just a single source of executive control over the brain, which is kind of the earlier uh, framework from the 1980s and 1990s. And really this has been pushed on by, well, partly brain imaging evidence, but also evidence from lesion studies showing that actually you can fractionate this, that sometimes you can, for instance, lose control uh, over kind of more emotional or reward stimuli, but maintain control over more classic intelligence measures, and vice versa. <clears throat> and that's the generally accepted division between the orbital and lateral uh, surfaces of the frontal lobes, that they correspond to what I call kind of hot and cold stimuli. So hot stimuli kind of, is kind of money, sex, this sort of thing. And the other one is more around colours and shapes, uh, and, and, and so on, that I would cold. There's a great consensus that actually you've got this kind of increased complexity going from the back to the front uh, of the frontal lobes, that the back is doing more simple learning uh, stimulus response mappings, and then adding more levels and tiers, be more complex, that you do this stimulus and response in this context, in that setting, and, and so on. These kind of nested rule structures seem to progress higher up. <coughs> There's somewhat less consensus over the left and the right frontal lobes doing different functions, but there is some uh, suggestive evidence. <clears throat>